free to sort of uh, insert yourself or ask questions as we go through this so that we're not doing all the talking. Yes, please feel free to ask me questions because I'm going to try and do my best to tell you what you might want to hear, but uh, there are probably a thousand other things I know that I'm happy to tell you that I just don't know that you know, want to know. So um, I'm Brad Stewart. Uh, just to give you a very brief orientation about myself, many of you know me already. Um, this is my 24th year here in Montgomery County. Um, I come from the life sciences industry, and I'll talk a, a lot about that today, not because um, of my background in life sciences, but because that's the fastest growing industry we have here in the county. Um, I'm a serial bi uh, entrepreneur in biotech. I've started multiple companies. My last one was based here in Maryland, um, and we were commercial in 18 countries around the world, um, doing all of our manufacturing here and shipping it around the world. So. Uh, that's sort of me from that perspective. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Maryland Life Sciences Organization. Uh, I've known Brian for a very long time for the Maryland Tech Council. And uh, just yesterday, we concluded our uh, annual bioinnovation uh, conference, which we were able to have in person at the Bethesda Country Club. Um, we had a limit of about 200 people there in person, but we held it virtually um, also. Um, last year, it was all virtual. Just to give you an idea of how many people we attract uh, here to showcase Montgomery County and our Maryland life sciences ecosystem, our keynote session yesterday morning had, had over 3,000 viewers live when we were going. So um, we're ha very happy that we can help to support and grow the economy here. So I'm going to share a few slides with you, uh, primarily just to, to uh, orient you a little bit about my thinking and our thinking and how we're approaching uh, growing businesses here in Montgomery County and helping to grow our economy. I'm saying that my share screen is not working right now. Sorry, we just tested this, so one second. Brad likes using two screens at the same time. So yeah, I have a screen here that I have to see in my cameras over here. So let me see if I can get this to work. We're waiting for Brad Tichi. I wanted to, um, I don't know if we want to acknowledge some of the board members that are on the line um, in the meeting here today. You are reading uh, my mind. Thank you. <laughs> Let's do that real quick. I neglected to do that up top. I mean, uh, Gigi, I mean, we should start with our board chair, Lowell Yoder, is in the meeting today. Hi, Lowell. Good morning. Great to be here. Just going down the line, I saw that Chris Carpenito joined and Leslie Ford Weber, who is co-chair of our Legislative Affairs Committee. Um, I saw Joe Sanchez, and it's on our board, and was on earlier. David Blair, welcome. Good morning. Uh, Gigi, am I missing anyone? Uh, Anise Cody, welcome, Anise. Yes, also Angela uh, Prentice is on, I believe. Hi, Angela. Billy Peel. Good morning. All right, thank you. I just wanted to interject with that. So, uh, Brad, looks like you're up and running. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Sorry about the technical challenge. Good morning, there. all. Um, you just tested that five minutes ago and it worked. So, um, for me, uh, one of the big things for uh, so I'm responsible for our business development team to get involved with a lot of other things. Uh, but for me, the real key for us to be successful is focus. Uh, it's very easy to be no things for all people uh, when really what we need to focus on is being the right things to the right people. Uh, so from the time I came into MCDC, which has been a little over a year and a half ago now, um, it really was what are the key, key areas where we need to focus where we can attract companies here, demonstrate a compelling value proposition for them to be here, and have the facilities, workforce, and tools they need to be successful and thrive here. Uh, so from that perspective, obviously, life sciences, I already mentioned, is one of our key target areas. Technology, hospitality, insurance and finance, uh, real estate, which is really um, a little bit more complicated, it could be working with the developers uh, in projects they're working on, helping them to find tenants, those sorts of things. Defense companies, and we have someone on our team who's focused on nonprofits. Um, many of those are large trade associations or other organizations with headquarters here in Montgomery County. 
we really want to help to expand entrepreneurship. Uh, Bill will talk about this in a little bit, but there is a tremendous opportunity to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem and, and quite honestly, an, an economic imperative to do that for Montgomery County to succeed. So one of the challenges with that is, oh, sorry about my dog in the background, is how we increase access to capital. Um, there are many of these businesses that don't yet uh, understand how to raise capital, know the sources of that capital. Uh, there's some great programs in the area that uh, we help to support and partner with. Uh, the Maryland Tech Council has the Venture Mentoring Service Program. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, in the past six years, the program's been operational. They've helped uh, companies raise over $120 million in capital to date. In addition to that, uh, over 50% of the businesses that they've helped to raise capital are my minority-led organizations. So there's some great uh, groups out there doing great work. We just need help pull them together and connect them to the right people um, more quickly and more effectively. Uh, and doing that helps to address inequities. Uh, and as I mentioned, growing partnerships and enhancing collaboration. So I mentioned life sciences and, and that being sort of my background. Uh, when I first came, um, uh, even here today, people talk about life sciences, life sciences. That's what's really uh, growing here in Montgomery County. Uh, life sciences is a hugely broad, term. Um, and for those of you not familiar with it, it could mean literally hundreds of different types of businesses. And my challenge uh, was, well, in within that, if I tell hundreds of different types of businesses, they're going to succeed here. And in reality, only three of them are going to succeed here. That's not very effective use of anyone's time. So for us, uh, immediately, it was starting to sit down and focus on out of those hundreds of different types of life sciences businesses, what are the ones that we truly can be successful with here? Uh, for us, it's in the cell and gene therapy space. It's one of the fastest growing, uh, most complex areas of uh, life sciences right now. Typically where uh, a person's cells are taken from their body, uh, they're genetically modified with something to treat or cure their disease. Uh, the cells are grown and then put back into the patient to help treat them. Um, we're leading the world in that area right now, but the competition is uh, fast upon us. Uh, but there are a lot of successes we'll talk about from that perspective. Uh, vaccine development, uh, even prior to the pandemic, uh, about 20% of the world's thought leaders in uh, vaccine development um, were located here in Maryland, uh, primarily here in Montgomery County, uh, not only through NIH, but a variety of other organizations. And then uh, international expansion, we really view this as being uh, a key place where companies from around the world can locate their corporate headquarters uh, for a variety of different reasons. So what does that look in, like in real life? I give presentations all the time to people all over the world uh, about the value that uh, exists here in Montgomery County. Uh, Kristen O'Keefe, who's our Vice President of Marketing, is marketing has a spectacular team that's helped us develop branding and uh, marketing materials uh, as you see, the immunology capital next to the nation's capital. So when we talk about those things that we do very well here, they really do all revolve around immunology. Uh, and this really is one of the most uh, predominant areas of development right now is how do we modify the body's immune system to uh, treat a disease, prevent a disease. Um, and so when I do this, uh, I start with an interesting problem, and it's, it's the the good reason you do things is you, you figure out what you need to do better. Most people don't know where Montgomery County, Maryland is. Uh, even though we live here, uh, I'm frequently talking to people that are in Europe, that are in Asia, that might be in California or somewhere else. Uh, they're not here in Maryland. Uh, and so they don't really have an orientation physically of where uh, Montgomery County is in the, in the United States. In addition to that, one unique challenge we face in the life sciences industry is Montgomery County is also right outside of Philadelphia uh, and is a county um, chock full of life sciences companies. And so the first reaction if people know about Montgomery County, they assume it's in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, so for us, uh, I found it helpful to start with this slide to sort of physically orient people to where Montgomery County is. Uh, close access to Philadelphia, New York, uh, obviously adjacent to Washington, DC. Um, and from that perspective, uh, people start to get an understanding of where we are in the mid-Atlantic uh, and the proximity we have to other places they may be familiar with. So as I mentioned, I've been here for 24 years now, and I really 
uh, during that time, thought about the tremendous number of assets that exist here in Montgomery County, but really how can I communicate those to people uh, and make sure they understand what an opportunity it is to be here. This slide is sort of the culmination of, of that thought and trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, I think there's so, two things on here you know and one you probably don't know. Uh, so we already know that the FDA is here, which is the world's largest regulator of healthcare products in the entire world. We take great pride in that. Uh, we point it out to people all the time. We also know the NIH is here, which is the largest uh, researcher of healthcare in the entire world. What I think most people don't realize is that the world's largest payer for healthcare products is here in Maryland also, and not that far from us in uh, White Marsh. Uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has a budget of, of over $1 trillion per year. Um, that's a trillion with a T, uh, where they pay for uh, healthcare services, primarily for Medicare. Uh, most of the Medicaid uh, payments are actually made by the state. So, uh, $1 trillion per year is a fraction of the U.S.'s healthcare budget. There's a tremendous number of private payers that add, on to that, add on to that, but it's larger than almost every other country's entire healthcare budget. So it really helps people to get an understanding of what types of assets, resources, people, connections exist here in Montgomery County and their access to those. Uh, last but not least, um, we put together a few slides to look at sort of the globalization that we've experienced here in Montgomery County. This doesn't get into the detail quite as much uh, just to make it readable, uh, but this sort of illustrates the number of companies that we have from around the world who've chosen to locate their US headquarters here in Montgomery County. We've done a tremendous job of attracting companies from all around the world. Um, you would think, or I would think, uh, having spent a long time working for a European company that we would have uh, sort of a more predominant predominance of European companies here because the uh, being closer in time zones, shorter travel distances and stuff. We actually have an incredible number of companies from Asia who've chosen to locate here for their corporate headquarters. Uh, so we're very thankful that we have been successful from that perspective. Uh, I'll stop sharing slides for a second. Here are the things I'd like to add. Those aren't our only successes. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of growth in life sciences. Um, as for, for those of you who don't know, uh, there are a large number of life sciences companies who've decided to um, expand or grow here. Uh, any of you who've driven down Prince Orchard Boulevard, uh, you'll notice uh, Novavax is in the process of building uh, a new vaccine manufacturing facility there, which is a great example of adaptive reuse. Um, we have a beautiful new facility across um, our across from Falls Grove, right on the Shady Grove Hospital campus. Regenix Bio is just opening their new corporate headquarters there. A uh, company called On Demand Pharmaceuticals, which is a spin out of DARPA, is located at Brian Goody now, uh, doing incredible things to actually synthesize drugs uh, locally uh, to use for warfare and pandemic uh, responsiveness. Uh, they're incredible things for those of you in the Silver Spring area, United Therapeutics, not only the incredible work they do, uh, but their hopes to expand that campus and, and start to do even more incredible things. There's a lot going on uh, from a life sciences perspective. We have about 1.6 million square feet of space that's under development now uh, to house life sciences companies. So we're very thankful for that. Um, and there are other big projects. We get involved with a, a lot of other uh, companies here, not just in life sciences. Um, as many of you see, the Marriott headquarters is making tremendous progress. They've closed the building. Um, it, it's amazing the transformation from getting the glass finished uh, is put up there. Swinburg Quarter, uh, the groundbreaking just happened recently here in uh, Rockville. Uh, for that, there was going to be another amazing development. So there's a lot going on. With that, I'll stop talking. I'm happy to answer any questions, or if not, I'm happy to turn it over to Bill and, and let him go forward. Any questions at this time for Brad? Okay, Bill, then I think we'll let you uh, take it from here. Okay, um, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about this comprehensive economic strategy. Uh, can everybody see this? Uh, let's see, let me go to slideshow. Um, as Joan mentioned, uh, the county council voted to have MCEDC take responsibility for putting this plan together, something that's done every four years and updated every two years. And I think the reason for doing that is that it was very disjointed. 
you had the county executive's office doing a piece. You have the county council who weighs in. You have Montgomery Planning. You have MCEDC. And the plan, while meant to be comprehensive, is not necessarily comprehensive. So the objective was to bring it all together and to bring the subject matter experts together under one roof uh, to make sure that it is done more thoroughly um, and that it's more impactful. I will say that we're not always the subject matter experts. So we'll be putting together or have a team of people and organizations such as planning or the Department of Transportation or the business community who will be weighing in in terms of looking at what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we're not the experts on how the uh, taxes in this county actually impact a business, you are. And the question is, is that competitive? Is it not competitive? Are there things we need to change or not change? So that's the reason for bringing together a consortium. There are some things that we're required to do. Um, and this is the boilerplate stuff that's in every economic plan, no matter where you go. Job creation, supporting strategic industries, retention and attraction of companies. And we always have this debate. We look at both. Um, retention has better long-term benefits um, because you're keeping the tax base here. It's a little bit easier. And as those businesses expand, um, they have, uh, there's more stickiness there. It doesn't mean we don't do attraction. Uh, and even during the pandemic, there are a lot of businesses that are still uh, very interested in coming here or adding a second headquarters or second office here. And of course, uh, supporting the tax base, but more importantly, increasing the entrepreneurial activity and actions that promote economic development going forward. Um, where is my cursor? Okay. Uh, we're also required to address these four issues, housing, transportation, workforce development, and business development. These are sort of the four pillars of the platform. I will say they're very broad. So it gives us a lot of leeway to do a lot of things. And in conversations we had yesterday, it's pretty clear that some of these things are not going to be resolved in the short term. These are long-term issues, long-term trends that need to be resolved. Transportation, you well know what's happening with the Purple Line or not happening. Uh, I-270 and the 495 expansion. Um, what we do within the county uh, bus rapid transit, the list goes on and on and on. Um, in terms of housing, uh, housing is a crisis across the country. And so we agree that we're going to talk about that and try to get at what we can do to address some of the shorter term housing issues. But um, it is a major challenge, not only for the region, but for Montgomery County in particular, because of the shortage of certain types of housing stocks that make this more affordable. Um, we're also responsible for making sure that we have a diversified and thriving economy so that it is not just the focus industries that Brad talked about, but that it sort of trickles down to smaller businesses. Uh, we traditionally have not been involved in retail or shopping center development, but increasingly we're finding that in order to have a comprehensive plan, uh, we have to incorporate that. Racial equity and social justice. Um, greater innovation, and we'll have fun defining what that really means, uh, and then environmental sustainability. As you're probably aware, the county has a comp a, uh, an environmental climate action plan that is some 250 pages long in the process of being implemented. And when you read through it, uh, those people are the most excited, most dynamic people you could ever meet. And it's all about climate. And we're trying to say, okay, it is. How does it impact economic development in the short and long term? And there are all the pros are there. There are trade-offs. So we're trying to work to figure out what are the things that are going to be most beneficial to businesses and what makes us competitive? How do we stand versus other jurisdictions? So you'll see that going throughout the plan. Um, I'm going to skip through this outline uh, because we're working on that now. Uh, but Nadia, if you don't mind, uh, Nadia is not only our council and special projects manager, she and I are sort of taking the lead in terms of putting this plan together. And uh, so do you want to go through these five areas of focus? Sure, happy to do that. Um, 
Our uh, research and strategy team has done some work. Um, as you all know, if you've been following economic development in the county, there have been um, numerous studies done in all different areas. And our team um, kind of looked at over 20 of those reports altogether over 90 recommendations. And we found that um, a lot of the recommendations could really be grouped together in certain um, big categories. And so we're kind of highlighting them here and we're thinking about these internally as we're engaging with stakeholders. Um, we particularly, we think that these these topic areas are ways to get um, folks all across county government and hopefully in the private sector to think a little bit more um, collaboratively and collectively about how different things that we do in each of our spheres can come together to support innovation and economic growth or to create a healthier um, environment for local businesses. Um, I can go through each of these kind of one by one. Um, the first one, innovation and economic growth. Um, as Bill and Brad have mentioned, we know that our county has a few um, competitive advantages in some key industries, and we want to make sure that we are, you know, retaining what we have, but continuing to build in those areas and really position Montgomery County for more growth through those targeted industries. Um, moving on to the healthy local business environment, we are looking at a number of ways to um, make sure that businesses are um, choosing Montgomery County and thriving here, whether those are um, reform, reforms or improvements we can make on the public sector side or um, different kinds of initiatives. Some are kind of place-based to enhance certain commercial corridors, um, potentially strengthen the local supply chain between um, companies that are operating and doing business here, um, as well as providing jobs and entrepreneurship. So that one is a really broad category and we're kind of looking forward to breaking that apart a little bit. Um, advancement opportunities, we wanna make sure as we're growing our jobs that there are opportunities for access to those jobs for all of our residents. Could you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, quality of life is another one that we're looking at. Um, for example, we're looking at public infrastructure and transportation as a quality of life issue. Um, some of these topics might fit in multiple areas of our plan. For example, transportation we know is really important to our quality of life, but it could also be really important to business and innovation growth. So um, again, right now, these topics are sort of just guidance for us as we're collecting information and kind of pulling together our plan. Um, but we know that you know maintaining a high quality of life is going to be really key for our economic development moving forward. And the last one, civic capacity, um, we wanna to work to build stronger partnerships um, between the public and private sector to address certain shared challenges, for example, climate change, like Bill mentioned, among other topics as well. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're looking at right now as we're collecting information and doing this kind of community outreach. So all of the chapters of the book will fall into these five categories, um, but I'm also gonna say, this is not without its challenges and issues. Uh, for instance, what are going to be the long term? What is the long term impact of what uh, the pandemic has done to us? How do we reset if necessary? Uh, the county is becoming what I would call increasingly trifurcated, in that we have the traditional higher income, wealthy individuals who make an important part of our makeup and a huge part piece of our tax base you have an increasingly large population of low income uh, populations who have lots of challenges. And then you have the great middle uh, who is losing out. We're losing out on those middle jobs. It's very difficult for households who are in that middle to find or buy homes and enjoy the American dream. Uh, we also have the challenge, which is also an opportunity of thinking more like the DMV and not just about Montgomery County. And so many of the efforts that we're focusing on, even through Connected DMV, are things that allow us to share resources. Um, we're working on multiple efforts there uh, to bring more dollars to the region, but it's not gonna be just Montgomery County. So we have to figure out how to incorporate those things in. Um, one of the challenges, yeah, was there a question? Joan, I, yeah, this is Joan. I have a quick question and I think it sure. was prompted by something that Nadia said about the supply chain. And I mm -hmm. know at so we are, uh, are really struggling with supply chain shortages and how that is impacting our ability to 
do our business. Um, have you seen that or considered that as a disruptor, perhaps more in the short term than the long term, and sort of the economic development plan? Has that been a point of discussion at all? Um, it has not been a major point of discussion. Um, my personal belief, because I've been studying this, is that it is more of a short-term disruptor. Um, you may have seen huge articles. I read the Post, New York Times, and the Journal every day. I can't remember which one it was, but did a huge article on what's happening with the ports of Los Angeles and uh, Long Beach and how that has had reverberating, reverberating impact across the entire world, um, across industries from Target to hotels, to hospitality, as you're speaking. But we believe that it is something that is going to digest itself, but it's probably gonna take six months to a year. Um, we have not thought about how we would incorporate that into the plan yet, but we'll take it down as a note. And that's part of the purpose for this meeting to look at things that we are not on our radar screen. So I'm glad you asked. Um, there are some other challenges, and I'll get into this slide in a second, uh, but when we talk about innovation and um, an entrepreneurial ecosystem, we talk about it, but what does it mean? Who is being innovative here? And how are we facilitating that? And how do you create an, a true ecosystem that allows not only startups, but startups that are well in their development mode to sort of breathe here and have better access to capital? So we are working on a plan at MCEDC itself to sort of create um, a MoCo innovation hub that brings those resources to more businesses so that if you need legal help, if you need training, if you need access to capital, if you need more mentoring, which you can find other places in the county, we want to facilitate that uh, because right now it's more talk than it is action. And um, we wanna look at other things that may be barriers to creating innovation here. There are some natural barriers um, that are tough to deal with. We're not attracting young people to move here. You know, the ages eight, uh, 25 to 44, even 18 to 25 are going to DC and parts of Northern Virginia at a much faster rate than they're coming here. And so if you think about younger people, that young spirit, that helps create an innovative environment. Uh, how do we overcome that? Now, fortunately, as individuals get a little bit older and settle down and have families, Montgomery County is a very attractive place to live in spite of the fact that we're expensive um, because other parts of the region are expensive too. So our challenge is to make this plan something that is real and not something that's just aspirational. Does it make a difference? Does it put more money in your pocket? Does it allow for long-term growth? Does it allow for others to come here and expand? And so we have a lot of partners that we are working with. Um, sorry, I am jumping back. Let me go back, sorry about that. Actually, I'm gonna stop there. We have a lot of partners that we're working with. Um, you would be one example and an important example where we're gonna check in regularly as we're putting the chapters together. Are these the right growth opportunities? Does it make it easier for you to do business here? What does making it easier to do business here mean? Um, we had a healthy discussion with the county executive yesterday. And um, I would say in the next month or so, you'll see a study coming out um, from JLL that looks at taxes here versus elsewhere. And based on the way the study was done, and I don't think it was jury rigged, I will see a draft of it shortly. Technically, we are cheaper to do business from a pure tax perspective or business fee perspective. But why is it that we have the reputation for being expensive? And I think in our discussion, we concluded that whether we are cheaper or not, if it's more difficult and if it takes longer and is more complex, then it doesn't matter. Most people will pay more, even if they don't know that they're paying more to get something done. Northern Virginia gets things done, does Montgomery County. Northern Virginia also has a different relationship with the state of Virginia in terms of how they work together for economic development. How well does Montgomery County work with the state of Maryland and commerce? Very different relationship. So lots of different things going on that are going to make this plan a little challenging to put together, but also um, I think pretty interesting. And so our questions to you are, 
what are the things that are driving you crazy or that you go, we have to do, we have to do differently, or we have to do more of to move this county forward from an economic development perspective. Um, and how do we judge ourselves against what we want to do? Less so about the competition, because you can think about DC, you can think about Northern Virginia, you can think about other areas where capital is going, but what is it that we as a county want to do for ourselves, regardless of what happens elsewhere? And that's where the quality of life comes in. That's where there are other factors um, that we need to take into consideration. Uh, as an example, uh, we have the Ag Reserve, which no other jurisdiction has in terms of that amount of space. 85% of the space in our county is accounted for. So you can't grow, you have to grow within the footprint that is here. Um, yet that Ag Reserve is something that is critically important to us in terms of quality of life and by the way, is an economic engine and a potentially even bigger economic engine. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it there. I see Ellen has a question or a comment. Go ahead, Ellen. Oh, thanks so much, Bill. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a very comprehensive plan, um, but of course it's all about the execution. So forgive me for being a little skeptic uh, mm -hmm. skeptical here, but we've seen iterations of economic development plans for years. A lot of the goals you mentioned, things that you talk about, we've seen come out from other groups, the Economic Development Advisory Group, the Business Roundtable, mm -hmm. um, your predis you know, the, the group um, that um, came before the MCEDC, the county exec. So, um, you know, always with some tweaks. So what will make it different this time? It's really all about the ex execution, what, what makes this different um, from the others in terms of being able to make things happen? Well, one of the things that um, I skipped through in the slides was the RACI um, chart, uh, which looks at who's responsible, accountable, and um, informed and communicated to. And what we're trying to do with the plan as we go through it is for those who are accountable in particular, for making it happen, we're asking them to sign up now. How are you going to do this? And then how do we put that into the plan? And along with the metrics that demonstrate either by year or over time, what has to be done in order to make this plan happen in reality. Uh, some of it is putting the resources in place up front, um, but I think it's getting partners aligned at the table before this plan gets approved rather than after the fact. Um, is it nirvana? Absolutely not. Um, do we have um, structural issues that get in the way? I, I would say yes. I mean, it is very odd, even though it sort of works, to have Montgomery planning its own individual entity, and then you have county government. Um, hopefully they work together. But if it was one entity, it would work even more smoothly. That's not going to change. So how do we work to make sure that we have Casey Anderson's group, and they are very strong partners with MCEDC. Uh, we do tons of things together. How do we take the resources that they have and the responsibilities they have and ensure that it fits into what the transportation plans are? Um, so I think having more people at the table debating this as we are today up front and saying, yes, we can do this, or identifying the things that we can't do uh, is gonna be more important. Um, I'm not trying, we're not trying to uh, turn the world around. We are realistic. We are practical. Um, our popul population is getting older. Income is flat. Um, we're not as competitive educationally, uh, but we still can move the county forward. And that's, that's the objective. It's not to find gold. It's to make sure that we have more momentum than we've had in the past. Uh, Leslie? Thing and everybody, thank you for that. One of the things I did, and it may have just been that it's part, not a part of this presentation, that I didn't see are the metrics that you're planning to track. So, for instance, in, in the slides that Nadia shared on seven and eight, it talked about the definitions of a healthy economy. Mm -hmm. but nowhere did I see one of the you know sort of burning platforms we've all been focused in on is the number of jobs being created, and jobs at particular income, you know, income levels. So is there another section of the report that's going to look at um, the momentum you're hoping to achieve in very concrete terms and over that four year period? Yes, we just haven't done it yet. Um, so as an example, if you take 
job growth. We, we have gone back to look at our 10-year history. We've looked at the history in other jurisdictions. So we will set a goal. What does real job growth look like? What, where does the tax base need to grow in order to support all the initiatives that go into the plan? Um, what, what about housing stock? How many housing units need to happen in order to satisfy the demand? Um, so the answer is metrics is an, a critical component of this. Um, I thought, I may not have mentioned it in the last slide, but metrics should have been there if it wasn't. Uh, we just haven't started on it yet because we're taking, we're doing the benchmarking now. Where are we today and where should we be, by the way? Um, and if there's a gap, we first have to address the gap. If there's not a gap, but we still wanna grow, then the question is by how much and what's realistic. Um, I think part of our challenge is that we talk about a four-year time horizon as opposed to a 10-year. And so I think what we'll probably do is set some longer term goals, but then the metrics have to fit into what we'll do within four years. As an example, the Climate Action Plan has a goal to get rid of carbon emissions, uh, reduce them by 80% by 2027 and to be gone by 2035. That's a much longer time horizon than what we're looking at. So the question is, how do you back into what will happen in four years or what type of trajectory do we need to be on to accomplish some longer term goals? Um, will the purple line be built before this plan is over? Um, and what is the financial impact? Uh, so the metrics will absolutely be there. Uh, Lowell? Yeah, I, I guess my question is probably a little softer. Uh, it's not real tangible, but I'm thinking you, you guys might give me a, a perspective on it. I, I challenged uh, our guys just yesterday, our business development folks um, came across something that said just a, a concept that if you had a billboard, what would it say? You know, just as how you differentiate yourself and, you know, what kind of competitive advantage do you bring to your customer base? And, and I'm curious when I, when I look at Montgomery County and try to do that kind of same concept, you know, if Montgomery County to the business community had a billboard, what would it say? And I'm curious if, and I understand playing to strengths, right, and, and where we are in life sciences, but I'm curious if playing to that strength, um, you know, I guess immunology capital next to the nation's capital plays to that. But I'm curious, does, does, in any way, does that detract from maybe other industries or perceptions um, around what the county may be able to, uh, to provide? And, and the last thing I would say is, and Gigi and I were talking about this just the other day, that um, you know, we, we work with the Harris Poll on, on various things, but one of the things that they've, they've found is that up to 50% of a buying decision of a consumer is based on the, the actions or inactions of the CEO of that particular company. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if, any of the, if, there's an inter, you know, if there's a connection there as well, when we talk about branding and curious why, um, why people have certain perceptions of the county versus maybe other areas. If there's any interplay between those, between those two, I'm just those are two probably two separate questions. But um, I'm just curious to what your thoughts might be on 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 those. Well, we have a lot of debate internally, um, obviously, um, and Brad can speak for himself. The example when he talked about the immunization capital next to the nation's capital is only, we, we believe that one size does not fit all. And that's part of the challenge that Montgomery County tries to make the one statement that we are X, Y, or Z. And so we believe that we have to have multiple branding messages depending on whom you're talking to, um, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I know nothing about life sciences and I choose not to. I grew up in a medical family and when my dad would take me to the hospital, I would go, this is just not gonna work. I am not going into medicine. I love business. So my focus is on some of those other industries. You take technology and you break it down and you look at how we can better compete. You take the nonprofit world. And by the way, both of us are nonprofits. I'm talking about the Montgomery Chamber and MCEDC. 7,000 nonprofits here. 2,000 probably make a real difference in terms of their impact on the economy. Uh, but there are so many other sectors out there that make it attractive for us as a diversified economy that we will address each one of those uh, with their, to a large extent, more targeted messages. 
Brad's point about focus is absolutely right. If we try to be all things to all people, we'll get nothing done fast. Uh, but our intention is to sort of segment the markets and have specific campaigns and areas of, of outreach depending on what the sector is. So you're not gonna get us Montgomery for all campaign or Maryland is open for business. Uh, we don't think that that is the answer or the solution, uh, that it needs to literally look at smaller sectors, smaller groups of people. In terms of CEOs, yeah, that's why uh, Boeing is headquartered in Chicago, you know, not Seattle anymore. Uh, you know, there's a reason that Marriott is here. That's where the Marriott's grew up. Um, but we also find that quality of life is becoming an increasingly important part of what makes this engine move. And quality of life then takes in the educational aspects, the fact that we probably have more green space than any other jurisdiction in the country, um, that uh, you have very diverse neighborhoods. I can go down the list. And that those are decisions that are not necessarily being made by an economic decision. Is my next job gonna be there? Personally, um, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but I think that the Amazon presence uh, is a win for this entire region. You know, whether they add 50,000 jobs or not, there are gonna be 50,000 jobs that come to this region. Not everybody is gonna work for Amazon for the rest of their career. They're gonna work there for two years and then go do something else. They're gonna attract other talent that has to be here and they're not all gonna live in Arlington and Alexandria. So how do we leverage the fact that we are on the map and part of the DMV? That's my personal feeling. Others of you should answer these questions too. I just show up and try to make the operations run I'm not a economic development visionary, Joe. Yeah, hi, thank you. So maybe, maybe I can help um, with that narrative. So as you, as you think about, again, creating the story around this and the narrative around this, it's really, people need to understand that it's not just the job you're creating, but that that job that's created needs other jobs to support it. Mm -hmm. And so it really, and it fans out from there. So although you say, well, we're gonna focus on our strengths or we're gonna go in this, in this direction, there's so many jobs that it's, it's a multiplier, right? And so if I look at if I look at non-durable goods, which the life sciences mostly make, that's a that's a job multiplier of five x. So for every job you create in that industry, you're gonna you're actually creating five more opportunities for other people. And for for durable goods, it's it's seven x. And so I think we we just tend to focus on the person we're putting into a particular position, or the person that's losing a role. And we're not considering the whole picture, which is all the other jobs and opportunities that are being affected by that by that one job. Just a recommendation as you as you build that story out. Absolutely, and and part of our challenge there, even if you go to small businesses in general, I did a lot of consulting work for Think Local DC before I joined MCEDC, and the impact of a small locally owned business is nine x compared to an AstraZeneca, believe it or not. Um, so how do we support that network? Um, and it's a challenge for us because MCEDC is, we, I, I call us a boutique economic development organization because we don't have all the assets or the resources. But if you don't have a bigger focus on small local businesses, then you're missing out. And how do we address that at the same time? So that will also be part of the plan. The question is who's gonna do it and who's gonna lead it. Um, I will say this, um, in one of the earlier questions about the CEO, I thought we were heading in a different direction. One of the things that I have found, having lived here for 39 years, I grew up, was born in Washington um, and have lived in Montgomery County for 39, is that I don't see as strong a leadership, um, I think there's a leadership vacuum in Montgomery County at the highest levels in the business community. And one could argue, I'm not talking about our current county executive, but county executives overall over the last many years that are taking the charge and saying, this is my vision and they're driving it through um, both in the business community and at the senior levels of government when it comes to economic development. I mentioned the fact that I think we have a different relationship with the state of Maryland. Um, so somehow we either have to help make that happen or work around it. Uh, I wonder whether it's in our DNA to have that type of environment here, 
Um, and to me, that is one of the challenges I also see, that there is a, a leadership vacuum just in general when it comes to focus and when it, as it relates to economic development. Other questions, comments? Uh, two industries that uh, you may have seen on the chart, one short-term, one long-term, it's not just about life sciences. Hospitality and hospitality tech um, are really important to us for a simple reason. The majority of the resources around the hospitality industry are anchored right here in Montgomery County or the DMV. You know, I don't know why Hilton is over in Virginia. It's because Chris Nosetta lives there. That's why. Uh, but one day, maybe he'll come back. Um, but you look at how, the, whether it's the REITs, whether it's hospitality management companies, there is such a powerful concentration here. And as hospitality morphs into technology related issues, that's another industry that we really want to grab and own. Um, Sodexo could probably talk a lot more about it than I ever could. Uh, but that's uh, a growing opportunity for us. Um, and then you're hearing about quantum computing. Uh, big deal, big money long term. We are investing in it, uh, working mostly through a consortium. And um, there is some competition out there, but many of you have seen the REACH Advisor study that we did where we talk about the quantum crescent that starts up near Clarksburg, comes all the way down through Montgomery County, down to 70, curves around through the purple line and goes off to uh, College Park and into Baltimore. Um, if we collectively really work hard on that, that's an industry that we can own um, and, but it's a long-term investment. So those are two things, short-term, long-term, uh, that are not exactly life sciences. Um, although the relationship between quantum and life sciences is very strong and Brad could speak to that more than I could. You have any other questions? So Bill, I have one, one other uh, just mm -hmm. comment and you, you touched on it and it's, it's about attracting young people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think in the, the conversations about quality of life, of course, dovetail with attracting young folks because we know how that, how important that is to them. The green spaces, the arts, you know, the entertainment, the, uh, the uh, places to gather um, such as in downtown Bethesda and, and socialize. How are you sort of bringing that into the study and the work that you guys are doing? Well, um, that's why we're also taking a close look at what planning has done. And I, to me, it's about Bethesda and Silver Spring. Uh, Bethesda is much further along, much more of a concerted effort, but Silver Spring is equally important in terms of creating that environment um, a little bit more complicated there. There are some things that are missing in Silver Spring, but the bottom line is we have to have a huge investment there because it is has the transportation um, network. It has more of an urban core. It has the diversity and excitement of activities. So it is those two communities um, that make a difference. Um, what we have really talked about unrelated to attracting younger people is dividing the county into quadrants because what works in up county is not necessarily important for the east county which desperately needs a new and different strategy um, so that's more of our focus looking at what each area needs as opposed to how you get young people here i don't know that we can solve the young people challenge uh, we can try but the short answer would be you got to push Bethesda and Silver Spring because those are the two that mo have the most advanced set of assets that are going to be attractive and compete with the Boston corridor, that Northern Virginia corridor, or DC. But um, we don't have an answer beyond that. And I'll, I'll add a little bit, Bill, if I can. One of the things that we try and incorporate in everything we do when we're talking to companies about why they should be in Montgomery County and what it has to offer. We do talk about quality of life. Um, I happen to be a runner, so I've probably run through every park in the county. It's amazing the amount of green space that's in uh, the county 
uh, next to such a large city and with so many sort of urban cores uh, scattered around it uh, and literally connect the entire county from end to end. So we do talk about the quality of life, the things like the agricultural reserve, the diversity of places you can live, um, whether you want to live in a, a more densely populated area like Bethesda with more restaurants and stuff or out in Damascus. I mean, there's uh, as much diversity in the types of places where you can live. Um, there's an interesting point that was sort of hit on before uh, when we talk about the number of nonprofits here, the diversity of the community we have. One of the reasons we're able to attract so many international companies here is because they're going to find people that are uh, like them. They're going to find people from their home country. They're going to find people who speak their native languages. They're going to find restaurants that serve the foods that they're familiar with. So um, that does make it easier for us to bring in uh, an international community. Uh, to give proper credit, Kevin Beverly one time uh, sort of reframed a thought in my mind in a very positive way, and that is because we have all of these uh, nonprofits that are focused on um, everything from social services to uh, different agendas or medical research or housing or anything else you could imagine, I think that really is an opportunity to uh, point out to companies that want to locate here that we do have a, uh, a base of things that can fulfill their employees. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that uh, we find here is companies asking, how am I going to get a workforce? How am I going to be able to fill the jobs that I have to fill? And so it's not just the quality of life or where you live and activities you have. It's what sort of organizations can I support? Can I work with um, that allow me to do the things outside of work, which I, I believe in and want to support? So there is a better story there that we keep trying to refine and pull together so people understand how unique Montgomery County is. Um, Joe hit on an important point. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I think we have immediately uh, that would have a big impact on our, our economy is workforce. Um, Joe will tell you, uh, I, I, don't, I won't ask you, Joe, uh, but they've got a huge number of jobs at AstraZeneca that they're looking to fill. Uh, I, I can tell you of the number of life sciences companies if uh, I talked to one the other day that could double their number of employees if they could just find them to hire them. Uh, so there is a a disconnect and a gap we need to close. We have a lot of people who live here in the county uh, that if reskilled, retrained, uh, might be able to move to much higher paying jobs and fill some of these positions. We have a gap in our educational system. I said this yesterday at the conference. Um, I know a lot of people in biotechnology because that's what I do. I actually have a lot of neighbors and just people I interact with. Uh, but that's not, I think, normal. Uh, I think we need to help um, more younger kids as they're thinking about their careers understand that uh, life sciences, which is a very uh, large and successful and high paying industry here in Montgomery County, has a broad diversity of not only people who work in the industry, but of the types of jobs that are in there. Uh, it's not simply uh, an industry where people are wearing a white lab coat and pipetting stuff from, from uh, one flask or um, test tube to the other. There are people who are doing finance, accounting, human resources, um, doing data sciences, uh, clinical researchers. Uh, it's, it's every job that you see everywhere else. Uh, so there's a tremendous, tremendous need to figure out how to close these gaps. Um, Montgomery College has been a, an incredible partner of ours, uh, Margaret and Helen Jones there, and helping to, to close some of these gaps. Uh, I can tell you Ann Kadamian, since she's been at the University of Shady Grove, constantly uh, is trying to help work and figure out how to close these gaps. So there are a tremendous number of opportunities. Um, as an example, you'll hear in the next few months, um, projects we're working on that will add another probably 1,500 to 2,000 jobs in the life sciences space here. Um, those jobs will all average over $100,000 a year. Uh, so, you know, I think we need to, uh, I don't want to harp on life sciences because that's what I do, but it is, um, someone was asking before, what are our strengths and how do we manage to execute upon them? Um, that's really an opportunity. And, and Joe also pointed this out. It has a big multiplier effect. Um, there's some very interesting companies located here in Montgomery County because we are successful in life sciences. Uh, if you go to West Watkins Mill, there's a company called St. Gobain that makes single use plastic containers for uh, doing biologic drug development. Um, 
So a lot of that follow-on effect happens when we're able to solve these problems, uh, provide the workforce, attract these companies here, let them surround themselves with each other. Bill hit on a very important point. There's not much space left here. Uh, that's this, that's one of the biggest challenges I have here also is there's just not much space uh, left to be able to accommodate some of these larger opportunities we have. They're going to go to Frederick. They're going to go to other places like that. And that's just sort of what we have to do with. Uh, but we've got a lot of great partners who are helping to build uh, new space here. Uh, and the challenge will be, can this county respond and work with them to get those buildings up quickly, get them occupied and people working, so. Well, I do have a correction. Up, you, oh, I was, just let me say one thing. <laughs> After you finish, Bill Lowe, you have your hand up. You wanna ask yeah, a question, just, then close us out, if you will, as board chair. Okay, okay very good. I was just gonna to, um, to ask the, uh, maybe a simple question about what we can do as a, as a Montgomery County Chamber to support you guys, promote, you know, promote your, your mission and also help fill in, you know, fill in any uh, leadership gap around the topic of economic development. What, what can we do? What more can we do to help support you guys? Because it's um, you know, very, very important, obviously. And I want to amplify Lowell's question because as an advocacy organization, I and mean, we're a C6, so we're a nonprofit, but we're not a charity. We're not a C3, we're a C6. And uh, we advocate at the federal level on behalf of small business federal contractors, which is a huge part of our economy here, uh, but also the state and the county. And, and I feel like that's, that is an area, of course, where we work closely with you all, but with everybody on this call. Um, so, you know, it, it would be helpful to, to get your, your thoughts on some of the legislation, some of the, what's an obstacle that needs to be removed. I think we have had those conversations in the past, but, but we, we have more to do, a lot more to do based on this. So um, I would say, how can we help? And either by bringing thought leaders together uh, or specific advocacy efforts to support the success of this effort? Um, three or four things that come to mind right, right now. I think we're meeting later this week or we're trying to on the advocacy related issues and legislation at the more at the state level but probably a little bit more focused on the county level, even though we have control over that. I mean, we have closer access. Um, the advocacy piece there in terms of real legislation that changes the economic equation here is important, number one. Number two, and this is not in order, make sure that you keep your fearless leader, Gigi, in place for a long, long time. Um, she is one of the biggest advocates for how you move forward. Uh, with a concerted effort that I've ever seen. Um, so that's critically important. I would also say that if we can come back as we're developing this plan and have you critique pieces of it that say, this is real, this is not. And then as it evolves before it gets voted on to say, yes, we support it. And this is what we will do. Um, there's one more question, but I have to make a correction for the record. When I answered the question about young people in Silver Spring and Bethesda, it's not just there. And I'm not playing to the audience, but I see Mickey Papillon on the call. Um, it, Pike and Rose is an incredible place. And it's developments like that, that attracts young people. You know the statistics. We have staff moving there. It is a hot area. It's small, but it's got everything that you want to be vibrant and exciting for a younger crowd, even people of my age. Um, you go up to Rio. So there are other pockets in the county that really do make a difference in terms of attracting a younger, more vibrant audience. So it's not just those two. So uh, Mickey didn't want to leave you out because that's a huge investment. And it's one that I, I know is paying off and will continue to pay off big dividends going forward. All good. Thanks, Bill. Um, and I did want to say one other thing, Bill. Thank you. That was that was you know we've got a great partnership, and and every uh, every board member, and member of the chamber, and guests that's on this call, we really you know we couldn't do it without the thought collective thought leadership. Um, on the subject of young people, you know, I'm the I've got three millennial uh, offspring of my own, and I want all of them to live here, and they aren't yet. And so I, this is very much on my mind about bringing young people here. And I do think uh, we have worked on this, but I think there's, there's um, I, I feel as though there's not been enough progress on issues, um, and a little bit of this is about COVID, where we were working on ways to support access to 
childcare, something that nobody used to want to talk about, but now everybody's running into this issue. It's a huge issue if you want to attract uh, young people, young families that do put down roots uh, in a community. And, um, and I feel like that's a, a big category of started but unfinished work there. And that is a county issue as well as a state issue. Uh, but I mean, there's so much more. The degree to which you are working, I'm glad to hear that you're working well. And I'm sure everybody on this call is glad to hear that you're working well uh, closely um, with the uh, park and planning uh, because there we know in surrounding jurisdictions that economic development and the planning functions, when they come together to help a company locate so that people aren't running all over the county trying to get something done, that makes a big difference. So I'm really happy to to hear that, and I'm happy for the for the participants on this call to hear it, Bill. But uh, and then I think missing middle, you know, missing middle jobs that you mentioned, missing middle housing. Um, you know, people have to be able to live here in order for uh, AstraZeneca for Joe to uh, hire those folks for Joan for all the employers that are on this call to hire people. They they've got to be you know here somewhere here. Uh, and preferably in this county, uh, you know, participating in the community and, and we'd have to get the next generation here. And you know, I have to say that as the mother of three members of the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned early care and education. Um, there's a bill before the county that's about to come out, supported by Montgomery moving forward. There are a couple of people here who are on their leadership team, of which I am, um, to create an ECE entity to really pull all the resources around early care and education together. And it would be unique for the country um, as um, an attractive way of looking at the whole spectrum of how kids get take, are taken care of, who takes care of them, when, how it's paid for. So as that legislation comes up for debate, I would hope that uh, this group would be a strong supporter of a, an independent ECE entity uh, so stay tuned over the next uh, probably three weeks and um, read the details of that because I think that's going to be very attractive for people who are looking at how they're going to raise kids and take care of them and whether there's the infrastructure there to make it easier. Well, I think we are out of time and I certainly want to be uh, cognizant of everybody's time. Um, this has been a great exchange. Um, and I very much appreciate everybody's participation. Um, Bill, Brad, and Nadia, thank you for taking the time this morning uh, to share with us. And we will definitely uh, commit to, be, to, to staying in touch with you, thinking about the plan. If we have any critiques, we, as you've asked us, we'll certainly get back in touch with you. But um, appreciate all that you're doing and appreciate all of our board members and people on the call who have weighed in. So thank you very much, Gigi. I'll turn it thank over to you, you Joan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, and uh, to our chair, do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to share with uh, before we sign off, Mr. Chairman? I, I would just say uh, thank you. I mean, this is, uh, I think, at the heart of what the chamber is all about, right, is the vibrancy that comes with uh, economic development. So we're clearly aligned. So thank you very much. Thanks, right. everyone. Thank you, and uh, I join uh, my chair, Joan McLaughlin, and uh, and our VP Government Relations. Thank you for Brian for pulling all this together, and of course, Bill, Brad, Nadia, great partners. Grateful for our partnership with you. Um, so it's onward and upward. Got work to do, and we're going to do it together. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next meetings. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day, everybody.